Morning, everyone. Morning. Good to see you this morning. You're very welcome. Good to have you all. Um, just having a quick scan for yeah, a few visitors. Good to have have you this morning if you're visiting with us, particularly here in Donegal. Um, announcements there going through um, the um, Ross Nowler tonight. Andy Lamberton is going to be with us tonight. Um, uh, speaking about his book on Daniel, speaking about Daniel. So Andy, um, many of you will know, works for Exodus and um, uh, has a, a great work among young people and young adults, and um, particularly fathers recently. So um, uh, well worth coming to hear Andy tonight. Um, long walk for Lorna, getting close this time next Sunday. I might be on my feet or might not be, depending on how well the Saturday goes. Uh, so we're leaving, uh, hopefully uh, the plan is to leave Sligo uh, at 8 in the morning and I think there's uh, four, uh, maybe five of us walking from Sligo and then the um, uh, first kind of group that's joining in is in Bundoran, some people are walking from Bundoran so the time to meet in Bundoran is 3.30, um, leaving from the tourist office which is just in the centre of town at the Holyrood Hotel, there's a small tourist office there, so gather up there. I talked to the guards this week to let them know it was on, and they told me that the, there's a hunger strike period in Bundoran that day, and so it's um, one o'clock, so it should be over, but uh, the guard just asked me to tell people um, that it could be a bit intimidating, and so just be aware that's in Bundoran. Um, but like I say, everything will be finished by the time we're leaving at 3.30. Um, then Ballyshannon, some people are walking from there. So the 10K starts just at the bottom of Ballyshannon on the way out to Finner, um, down the bottom of the town, turn right out towards Finner. There's a, um, they'll be meeting up along the, the way there, just past the Garda Barracks. That's where the 10K to the house is. And um, there'll be somebody there with a, a sign to sort of know where you gather, just opposite, there's a tire center. So it's just opposite that. Um, and that's uh, leaving there about half past four, quarter to five, that kind of time. Um, and then be at the house sometime between half six and seven. People have been asking about the house. Um, we really don't want any fuss or any hanging around the house. It's not fair and Gary and that. So it's simply walk there and move away quite quickly and um, uh, just to keep things very low key for, for the family as much as possible um, is the, the idea. So. Um, that's everything I think for the, the walk, um, I think that's everything that's there, friendship group uh, this Friday in the hall and the only other thing, uh, two other things, um, uh, apparently there's an event on the water bus in a couple of weeks time, um, my sort of uh, leaving uh, party or whether you're planning to throw me overboard or what, um, the, uh, there's about 20 tickets I'm told left um, so if there are others that you know want to come and um, speak to Jean about those 20 tickets and um, first come first served for those and um, the final thing then is just uh, with regards to Sunday school sort of uh, heading towards September again and um, Jean or Sarah and Adele have um, uh, agreed to sort of coordinate and organize Sunday school going forward and um, they're just uh, asked me to mention about anybody wanting to volunteer get involved that would be uh, that would be great and um, so there there are a number of names already from last year but if there's others that would be that would be brilliant as well so speak to sarah or adele about that So those were a lot of announcements this morning, but we're here uh, first and foremost to uh, worship, obviously, together. And as usual, this is just not playing ball. So let's come and, and praise and worship together. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is Jesus this morning of our focus, our attention, our love, our, our worship, our songs, our praise. Let's uh, join together and sing what is our hope in life and death, Christ the Lord.
Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have hope in life and even hope in death. We thank you at the very heart of our Christian faith, at the very heart of our our trust in Jesus is this knowledge that he holds us and keeps us today and forever in life and in death, in every up and down of this world and even through that great barrier of of death and to, to what is to come. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can trust in your love, trust in your work, trust in all that you have done and all that you are. We thank you that our hope is not built in just some fairy tales or some wishful thinking. Our hope is built on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promises and word of God on your character and nature and your ability to carry through all your will and purposes. Father, we thank you that we built our life on solid ground. We build our hope on solid rock. We build on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. So as we gather this morning, we want to just give thanks for your love and care, your, your presence that has been with us, your presence that is here with us. Lord, as we gather this morning, would we just again be touched by your spirit? Would our minds and hearts be open to your presence? Would you just come and bless us as we worship and fellowship together? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I've... uh, used this video before but it's a long time ago and I'm certain the kids won't remember and I'm guessing probably the adults won't remember either. It's a video, the quality isn't great, it's taken off internet clips and stuff but it's uh, it's what happens next so you watch a bit of a video and then something's going to happen next so you have to work out what's going to Okay, so what happens next? Goalkeeper's up for the corner. <laughs> Any ideas? Referee scores the goal. Referee scores the goal. Here we go. Wasn't the referee scored the goal, it was the goalkeeper. So very unusual for the goalkeeper to score a header. Number two. See what happens next. Lightning. Lightning. Two cars come around the corner. Two cars around the corner. Landslide. to those who expected the landslide. (laughs) Throws him over the bridge. Throws the bike over. Gets mad.
like the way some of your minds work. <laughs> The goalkeeper scores, he's busy celebrating. <laughs> goalkeeper scores this time when he's busy celebrating. Hmm? Trips and falls. The other team score. So as he's running back, the other team score. Yeah. He has to go back into the goals, and the other team have scored from the kickoff. Okay, so the tires come off and it's bouncing the bikes. What happens next? Crash. Tire goes back in place. Okay, here we go. Tire bounces out onto the road. Park beside the racetrack. <laughs> Final one. Having a chat, cycling along. Hmm? They lose. One falls and they all go down. Exactly, and one falls and takes the rest all, all down in a pile up. I finally proved to Janice yesterday that I'm a genius. <laughs> it's only taken about 28 years. Um, I, we were watching football in the town, watching the Liverpool match, and um, I turned around and I looked to her and I says, Jota is just about to score. And sure enough, about a minute later, I just kept looking at her. He's just about to score. About a minute later, who scored, Janice? Jota. Jota scores. <laughs> and Janice looked at me. I thought, finally, I've proved I'm a genius. What had, um, I had slight help because what I realized was that um, the TV was slightly behind my phone. So on the phone, I had seen that Jota scored. And then a minute later on the TV screen, the goal was up on the TV screen. So I had some kind of insider information that uh, I knew what was going to happen before it happened. Um, this is all an introduction to our Bible reading, by the way, because um, we're going to read from Revelation chapter 1. And look at the first verse, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servants what must soon take place. Revelation is all about saying this is what's going to happen. I am not a genius that can predict the future. Some of you were able to guess something about what was going to happen in those video clips. This, God's word says, Jesus has been given this revelation to tell us what's going to, to happen, what will take place. So we're going, to, we're going to read together as we have been doing, reading verse about and read verse 1. So this is God's word. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. A 
And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him he loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Amen. And we thank God for his word. Okay, we, uh, we have uh, uh, sheets for the kids and sweets and pens. And there is, um, I forgot to check the rota this morning, there's usually a crash for under school age. Um, I, I can't remember, like I said, I didn't check the rota to check who was on, but uh, hopefully there's a crash for if uh, they want to stay in school, if they want to stay in the church. There's a sheet here, pick up the sheets and a bag of sweets and some pens. And uh, if uh, crash happens, then leave uh, during the next hymn, which is Before the Throne of God. So come and grab your stuff. And while we're singing, you can you can grab your sheets and your your pens. Let's sing together. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea.
21 years ago when I started preaching in Ballyshan and, and this church, um, I started in the very first um, series, I started, the very first place I started was Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It seemed a logical place to start at the time. And we looked at uh, the very beginning, God creating and moved on from there. Um, I've been going through filing cabinets and sermon notes and all the stuff over the last uh, couple of weeks and um, realised there's been a lot of sermons over those years. And um, uh, I have preached in Revelation, but I thought for the last couple of uh, Sundays that I'm here that I would uh, finish up with preaching just a, a few great passages from Revelation. And that's where we're, we're going to look at these first few verses where... Um, well, before I get to that, Revelation is one of those really confusing books very often where people look at it and think it's all full of uh, these strange things that um, uh, are all about just predicting the future and people have tried for generation after generation to tie everything into human um, activities and what's happening, what's this and what's that. And that's not actually the purpose of Revelation at all. Revelation is given first and foremost to help people get through today with faith. Okay, Revelation is written to people who are being persecuted, people who are being stretched in their faith and literally being fed to lions. And Revelation is this encouragement that in the midst of all this persecution and evil and broken world, that there is a plan and a purpose that will be unveiled and unwrapped that God has revealed to Jesus that Jesus is at the very heart of all that is to come. So it's not just about predicting the future, it's to help his people draw encouragement from what the real truth about the future and the present and indeed the past is. And it introduces us over and over again to God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and even in those first few verses, we see God in lots of great titles. The one who was and is and is to come is a phrase that's used. Slightly inaccurate. It says in the passage that we read, the one who is and was and is to come. The order is different. It's not that you start in the past with God who was and now is. and it's The language says that he is and he was and he is to come. And that struck me when I was looking at it because I think that's really important. That day by day we realise that actually God is. He's present and real and just as powerful as he was or as he will be. Often people look at Christianity as something to do with the past and they maybe look to heaven and the future but the, the daily walk and presence and knowledge of God is the bit that's often lacking and and struggling with and here God says I am I'm here I God who is and who was and who is to come this eternal being who was there always before the creation always there who will always be there after the end and for all eternity but he is and again you see the same in the other language Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end of the alphabet, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, looks like he's pointing us to one who was always there and one who will always be there. But the first couple of words are also important. I am. Again, that's about presence and life. Now, God, when he gave the name uh, way back in Genesis, when he gave his name, the name that he was to be known as to his people, he said, I am the living one, the, the I am who I am. That phrase that's impossible to almost translate because it's literally just about being. I am. I, you know, been there ever since the beginning and I'm right there staying, but I am. The knowledge that God is just as powerful, just as real, just as present, just as ruling now as he always has been, as he always will be. That's at the very heart of these titles and names and introduction to the Father, the Almighty God. The one who has created all things. The one who is ruling over all things. The one who will rule for all eternity. Bringing 
this world to an end and creating the new heavens and the new earth, this unveiling and wrapping of this revelation story at the very heart of everything and all things is the almighty, eternal, living God. We call him Father, God the Father. The Spirit's there as well. And again, mentioned a number of times that the sevenfold spirit of God that's mentioned in Revelation 7 being the perfect number, the complete number, this spiritual being, this not just an energy or a force, but the, the, the reality of God in spirit form. And of course, the Son, the Trinity that's there, and you get the Father. And they're just for those great titles, you get the Spirit mentioned a couple of times, and then you have this focus on Jesus. And within a couple of verses, Jesus is given, there's just, he is this, 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 this. First one, he is the faithful witness. Somebody was to ask you, who is Jesus? And the lots of answers you would probably give, I almost guarantee you'd never say he's the faithful witness. That's just not something that would naturally spring to you. So why is it the first mention of Jesus here, why is he called the faithful witness? Because this is all about the unveiling and unwrapping of the revelation of God. The Father has said, this is what is, this is what was, this is what will be. And here's Jesus, who you have told it to, he's going to share it and show it and unveil it and unwrap it. Jesus is the faithful witness who is telling the truth who is able to point you to what is real and important, the faithful witness. Again, imagine you're uh, one of these early disciples. John is on the island of Patmos. He's there being uh, isolated because of his faith. They haven't just killed him. He's an old man, but he's been sent off into exile. And others are facing death. Others are being persecuted. Being a faithful witness. It's hugely challenging and hugely difficult to be faithful in the face of that persecution, to continue to witness and testify to the truth of God. So this language about Jesus being the faithful witness is really important. He is the one who came from the Father and said, let me tell you about the Father. Let me tell you truth. Let me tell you what's right. Let me tell you everything you need to know. Jesus is the faithful witness. If you ever doubt anything, go to Jesus, because he's the one who holds the truth and is the truth. He's the one who always points us to what is true. He's the firstborn of the dead. Again, not language you might use, but you would say he's the one who died and was resurrected. He's the one who died and rose again. That's the firstborn of the dead, the resurrection. Jesus, we're told, is the one who is the firstborn of the dead. He was the first to be resurrected. The, the new creation, this new uh, life form that happened at Jesus' resurrection. He died as a human being and God raised him to eternal life. God raised him a resurrected man. He is the firstborn. First means there's going to be more coming after. He is the, the one who goes ahead and he's the one who does it. He's the one who conquers death so that all who believe in him will follow in this reality and this experience of being raised and resurrected to eternal life. We believe in Jesus who died to conquer death so that he could be raised to this new life, this new type of eternal life. And he's the first who goes ahead to share that life with those who believe and who follow. He's the king, not just the king, he's the ruler of the kings. He's the king of kings. In John's world and the world of Revelation, there were lots of different kings and rulers. There was lots of different small kingdoms. But the one big, powerful nation and rulers and, and was the emperor and the whole Roman Empire. 
And that Roman Empire had stretched and, and conquered and ruled for a long time. And if anybody uh, sort of uh, resisted them, they had the power and the sword that could, could demolish. And, and, and the, the emperor was the one who ruled. And he was given names like the Divine One, the Son of God. He was the one who was the, the light of the world. All these words were applied to the, the emperor of Rome. And here, in the face of the persecution, in the face of all the brokenness of the world, in the face of all the false claims, are people who say that Jesus is the ruler of all things, the ruler of the kings. He's the ruler of everything. It's important for us to truly know that and believe that. As we live our lives today, Jesus rules and reigns. And that's primarily the message of Revelation, that here you have Jesus, the one who's won the right to be on the throne of God, who's been the firstborn raised from the dead. He's seated on the throne. He is Lord. He is King. And everything, everything is under his authority. So there you have the introduction to Jesus. He is the faithful witness he is the firstborn of the dead. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. And then it says, he's the one who made us. He's the one who made us. When we think about that, we think about uh, being created as human beings. And, and that's true, Jesus created. He, John 1 tells us, you know, he was there at the beginning. He was part of that whole uh, creation of human life and human world and everything. He's the one who made us that way. But that's not what this is talking about. He's the one who made us. Let me read it. He is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest. The one who made us has not anything to do with our physical creation. It's about what he made his people through his death, through his resurrection. It's what he's made his people to be as his church, his family. Jesus is the one who saved us from something and saved us to something and for something. He's the one who saved us from death and from sin. We talk a lot about that in church. Most people, most people, if they know anything about Jesus, knows that he died to save us from our sins. That's the fundamental message at the heart of what we talk about and, and preach and believe and proclaim. And it's incredibly important, centrally important. But it's also important that we realise that we're not just saved from something, we're saved for something. We're saved to be something. Probably one of the themes that I've developed over my years of preaching is this trying to help us understand who we are and who God has made us to be in Christ. He saved us from sin and he saved us for a purpose. The Lamb has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, is what it says. That's not actually, again, accurate. It's amazing when you find these pictures online, often they don't quite get it right. A kingdom and priests. So the Lamb has made us to be a kingdom and a priest to serve our God. Jesus is the one who has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God. He's the king, the king of all kings. He's the king who has made us to be a kingdom. It's what Revelation 1 says. He's the king who rules over all kings and he has made us to be a kingdom. What does it mean for us to be a kingdom? A kingdom is usually a piece of land, isn't it? You know, it's a place with a border around it where the king reigns and he rules over that kingdom. The language of people being a kingdom is quite different, quite unusual. We are to be a kingdom. We are to be the land where Jesus rules and reigns. We are to be his people, his territory 
his nation. This is about how we stand with him, how we belong to him, how we worship him. So Jesus taught about this kingdom that would come and people would either be inside the kingdom of God or outside the kingdom of God. Here you have Jesus making us into his kingdom so that we will be people who will worship the king, serve the king, honour the king, live for the king. Our whole identity and being is that we are people of the king. We serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We are his people. He has made us to be that. If you were to go home, make yourself a crown, <coughs> sit down at the dinner table this afternoon wearing your crown, holding your scepter, if you were to uh, pray around all week saying you were royalty, I wonder how long it would be before somebody would ring the hospital and try and get you locked up. Illusions of grandeur. If this is true, we should have illusions of grandeur because this is incredible that God has taken sinful, lost human beings and has rescued them and redeemed them and raised them to be his family, his people, his kingdom. He will inherit all that he has and all that he is. He will rule and reign with him forevermore. This is the message that Revelation gives to these people who are hanging on to life and hanging on to faith by their fingernails. He says, remember what Jesus, remember who he is and remember what he's done. As you're being persecuted and as you're being killed, as you're being whatever, you're a kingdom. An eternal, everlasting kingdom. People who belong to the king that can never be snatched from him. Peter talks about it in this language. You're a chosen people, a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. If I was to leave here and start saying they're really peculiar people in Donegal, you wouldn't take that too kindly, would you? But actually that's the language here, this peculiar people, are people, an unusual people because they belong to God. That's the whole idea here, that we are this nation, this people, this kingdom set apart to belong to him. No longer the, the Old Testament land of Israel, now God's people are a people, a family, a nation, gathered from every part of the world to be his holy people, his special people. So we remember who we are, who God has made us to be. Remember this king that we serve, this king who will come. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Every eye will see him when he comes. He will return as he went he will return with the, the clouds. The first coming of Jesus was, was sort of under the radar, wasn't it? He came as a baby. He came to our, our really backwater community. He came uh, almost secretly. Apart from the odd angel telling the odd person, people around the world didn't know that anything unusual was happening. He grew up quietly. He ministered in a largely rural backwater part of the empire. Most people in Rome never heard of his existence. The second time he comes will be different. He will come and every eye will see. Even the people who pierced him, not just those who are, every people of every time will see him. All the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. That's an unusual line, isn't it? Why will they mourn? Because they don't want the king. Because they don't serve the king. Because the king isn't their king. That's all about the, the judgment that Revelation tells us about. The, the putting light of the brokenness and the sinfulness. The people who haven't acknowledge the king will then have to stand before the king and it will be a terrible 
place to be. God's people have been raised to be a kingdom with him. And this king will come and he will gather his people and his people will be part of his eternal kingdom. Holy, perfect, glorious, everlasting. He made us to be a kingdom and he made us to be priests. People, when we think of kings and royalty, always uh, you think you know of power and privilege and and you know the the commanding and all those high and lofty things. But Jesus didn't come as high and lofty. Surely didn't he came as the the servant king? He came as the one who who didn't sit on a throne but gathered at people's feet. He came not riding in a great white horse. He came riding on a donkey. He was the one who came to serve and to love the servant king. The one who gave his life for his people. And that helps us transition into this other idea that we are called to be priests, people who serve. People who serve the servant king. We are a kingdom and priests. Priests to serve our God. Again, we have to get our head around the, the whole change in language here, don't we? When we think about a priest now in Ireland, we think about the called individual who works in the Catholic Church, and that's our, a priest in, in Ireland. Uh, this is talking about the priesthood of all, all believers, that everybody who believes in Jesus is called to be his, his priest. It's one of these big doctrines, these big ideas that, that every one of us are called to be these servants of God who, who serve. Some are called to special work, but everyone's called to be priests who serve. Priests are really about three things. Priests are set apart. So in the Old Testament you have the old priesthood uh, set up and, and these priests are taken and they're, they're set apart for this work in the temple, this special work. So the whole idea of being a priest is to be set apart as holy. You are set apart as holy as you belong to God, as you are his family. Again, this is something that always has amused me and continues to amuse me about being a minister. People see you as more holy than other ordinary holy people. And that's just so not biblical. And so not true either. Priests, we're all just the same. We're called to different types of work. But we're all called to be people set apart to serve our God, our Father, our King. Priests, all in Involved with the, the sacrifice of priests came and offered sacrifices. The whole idea in the New Testament is that we don't offer sacrifices. We are sacrifices. Our lives are laid down in service and sacrifice. A very familiar verse from Romans that talks about giving ourselves as daily offerings, daily sacrifices, where we give ourselves our time, our energy, our lives, to be God's people, to serve him and to serve one another and to serve the world that we find ourselves in, to serve. He made us to be priests, to serve him and to serve the church and to serve the world. That's our fundamental nature and character and identity. Who we are, we as God's people, we're people who are made to be a kingdom and priests. If you were to ask me um, the part of my job I dislike the most, apart from sort of uh, uh, lots of meetings and stuff, the, the part that I probably find most difficult and the part I struggle with the most is this, uh, the idea that when, you know, if you need something done in the church, the minister asks you and then you can't say no to the minister, you have to sort of say yes. And, and um, I really struggle with that whole concept that if I ask you to do something, then you feel an obligation and a guilt to, and all the stuff that goes with that. And, and that's, um, that's something I struggle and have wrestled with over the years. Um, 
But now that I'm, I'm moving on to a new sphere of service, I can encourage you to continue to serve one another and to continue to serve, not for my benefit, but for your benefit, for your church benefit, for your community, for God's glory. Because serving is still absolutely key and crucial. And there's lots of jobs and roles that need to be done in, in church life and, and those are important. There's lots of opportunities and ways that you as individuals can help and support and nurture and encourage each other and one another. Serving is who God has called you to be. And so during the vacancy, um, it's a time for you to think about that and work together to work out what that looks like and how this congregation continues to be a place where people work hard together, work as a community together, work for the glory of God together. Because that's the wonderful calling that God has placed upon us. One of the other great things about Revelation are just these explosions of praise and delight and acknowledgement. To him be glory, to him be power, to him be everything. Forever and ever. And like I say, that happens over and over again throughout Revelation. Is that the story of Jesus, the story of what God has done and is doing and will do, is revealed when you see Jesus and when you see the calling and see the victory and you see this king seated and the future that he has for his people, it calls his people just to stop and say, wow, it's awesome, it's glorious. Now, if you're hiding away in your hovel and you're afraid of the Roman soldiers knocking the door, and your family have turned their back on you because they're Jews and they don't want anything to do with this new, strange, weird stuff. Revelation brings a blessing because it lifts you up and it shows you. In the midst of all the brokenness of life, in the midst of all the struggle of holding on, Jesus reigns. Jesus rules. And you have a place with him and a place that's secure in him and a purpose and a meaning that stretches out across all of eternity. What a glorious picture. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the glimpses we have, the, the things that we've seen, the things that we've tasted. Father, we long just that you would reveal even more, not just of the future, that you would reveal more of, of yourself, of your, your presence and your life and your glory and your beauty and your, your wonder, that we would be caught up in you so that we would have these firm and deep convictions that are are based on truth based on Jesus and all that he has done and is doing and will do so that when life gets difficult when our minds are racing when our hearts are are struggling when we're weary and worn down father we pray that you would just Help us to be encouraged and uplifted and always able to see the big picture of who you are and what you've done and what you are doing and what you will do and how we are caught up into that whole story. So Father, we pray that as we go from here this morning that you would go with us and ahead of us, that you would hold us and keep us that you would help us to live as your 
your kingdom and your priests, that we would just, in our own ordinary, everyday ways, through our, our words and our actions and everything that we are, that we would just be people who love you and people who love others in your name. We continue to pray for your presence in all that we do together. We thank you for the opportunity just to to work together next Saturday for, for the walk and pray for your blessing upon that and for uh, blessing and hand of safety and everything that happens. And, and Father, would you just uh, allow that to be an opportunity where we just show practical care and concern for one of our, our families. Father, remember those who are sick, those who are struggling, those who are in hospital. Father, we just want to pray for your blessing upon them this morning, for your presence with them. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Jesus is the name we honour. Jesus is the name we praise. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>